Three, two, one. All right, welcome to the first and hopefully only online video for Math 492 this wonderful fall 2021. Okay, uh, so we will see what the rest of the semester brings, but let's get right to it. Okay, so where are we at? What are we doing? What's the story? Okay, so we are talking uh, topology. All right, and uh, again, let's remind ourselves what is topology. Well, as I noted, if you get 10 different mathematicians in a room and ask them to each come up with a definition of topology, you're going to get like 13, 14, 15 different def um, uh, definitions, right? Because depending on where you are in math, your interaction with topology is going to be vastly different from others. It's a very, like I said, very malleable uh, subject. Now, uh, for me personally, uh, what I think it is, is that it's the study of continuity. All right, and then, so that leads us to the first thing we're going to prove. Uh, so we left off of this, and I was going to try to half-ass the proof of this because we were running low on time, but then I was like, no, 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 this is, this is important. We need to actually prove this. So let's, uh, well, let, let's actually prove this. All right, so uh, last time, um, as I noted, Topology, to me, is the study of continuity. So last time we really got into continuity. All right, as we noted, um, you know, when we first encounter continuity in calculus, it's kind of just like a day, you know, and it's like, oh, continuous functions are nice. You know, hey, we got the intermediate value theorem, we got the extreme value theorem, theorems that we're going to come up with really nice topological proofs of later on. Um, right, but we noted that, oh, it's like, yeah, the limits are nice, essentially. And then, as we noted, that's kind of 100% the truth. It, it mostly is, but continuity has a much broader definition involving epsilons and deltas. Okay. And while the epsilon-delta definition is really nice for continuity, we kind of pointed out that it's very specific to real numbers, right? I need to talk about absolute values and differences and you know, just things that are very real number specific. So, right, even thinking of like, well, I go to Calc 3, you know, I talk about continuous functions there, but they have, you know, their inputs aren't real, their inputs are multi-valued, multi-variable. So what do I, you know, what does continuity mean in that case? Right, so there are multiple settings for continuity to be studied, so we're going to make the first step here of going, hey, you can talk continuity, and it doesn't need to only involve real numbers, but this proof we're about to do here sends us in the right direction. So let's get into it. So uh, we are going to prove that a function is continuous, so given an epsilon, I can find a delta that makes me happy, if and only if, given any open uh, subset of the real line, f inverse of u, the inverse image of u, is a open subset in A. So again, remember the way we define continuity, uh, we define it to be uh, open relative to another set, and there was very good reason for that, as we will see. Uh, all right, so let's get to it. So it's an if and only if, so suppose f is continuous. What do I want to do? I want to show you that any open subset of the reals, the inverse image is open in A. All right, so I've got an open set, and I need to verify the inverse image is open, so I'm probably going to use the fact that I've got continuity and I've got an open set here. All right, so what does it mean to be open in A? That means that given any element of the set, I can find a positive real number, so that the interval A minus that number to A plus that number intersected with A is contained in the set. All right, so let's take an element that lives in the inverse image of U. What does that mean? That means the output lives in U. So again, this set is just precisely the inputs whose output live in the set. And oh, hey, look at this. The set I have is open, and since I live in it, that means I can find a epsilon so that the interval remains within the set. Now, note by hypothesis is an open subset of the reals, so there is no intersection um, here because you're intersecting with the reals. That's a subset of the reals. The intersection doesn't do anything in that case. All right. Hey, so I got this stuff. That's pretty good. Now, what do I do? Okay. So, right, if we're just pausing here and trying to get, like, intuition or go, like, ooh, what's, what would the next step be? Well, let's think about what we just got. We got a epsilon. We got a positive number. What are my assumptions? I have continuity. Hey, if I have a positive uh, real number and I've got continuity and I have an input, 
hey, I can find a Delta. Specifically that um, there is a Delta so that for any X, so that X minus A is less than Delta, the outputs are within Epsilon. So, ooh, hey, look, I've got a uh, Delta. So, note, hey, so that means I now have an interval that I've got access to. And so what do I want to show? I want to show that this is contained in the inverse image of U. So taking the element in here, that means that we must be in A and that the distance from X to A is less than Delta. Okay. Now, since F is continuous, that Delta guarantees that the outputs are less than Epsilon. Now, what does that mean? That means f of x lives in this interval, which is a subset of u from up here. So that means x is in the inverse image of u. Therefore, this interval intersected with a is contained in the inverse image of u, which precisely means that f inverse is open in a. Beautiful. So I love this proof. This is definitely one of my favorites. Um, it's one of my favorites because it's, um, in my opinion, incredibly elegant, right? Because every sentence here, every little step we do is just restating the definitions that we've got, right? Start with continuity, take an open set, pick an element in here. That means you're in the open set. That means you've got an epsilon. I've got an epsilon. By continuity, I've got a delta. All right. Hey, what do I want? I want a interval that lives in here. So, hey, use that delta to make that interval. And that's precisely the interval you need. It's just this, it's a wonderful unraveling of definitions. Just each step is just, uh, it's real, it's real beautiful here, real elegant to me. So continuity ensures that the inverse image of every open set remains open. So let's do the converse now. Conversely, suppose that uh, the inverse image of any open set is open. I want to demonstrate continuity. All right, so take any element of A. And let's take an epsilon. All right, well, as we proved, open intervals are open. So that's a good thing. Uh, and what does that then mean? Hey, this is an open set, so the inverse image of this thing must be open in A. Hey, there's a concept that works. Uh, 20 million other white wrappers immerse. All right. So since that's open in A, I'm pretty happy about that. So it would be great if I had an element that lived in this set, because since it's open, then I'd get a delta. And oh, hey, I've got an epsilon. I got a delta. Probably got continuity. All right. Well, let's think about something that would live in this set. Now, spoilers, A lives in this set because F of A is obviously in this interval. It's the midpoint of this interval, even. How about that? So that would mean that A lives in the inverse image of this. Now, since this is open in A, there is a delta so that this set remains inside here. So I've got my epsilon, I've got my delta. Now I just need to demonstrate that the continuity is occurring at A. Okay, so take any element X that lives in big A that is within delta of A. I'm going to show that F of X is within epsilon of F of A. All right. So since we're in here and we're in A, that means we're in this interval. That is a subset of this inverse image. So that must mean that f of x lives in this set, which means exactly what I wanted to happen. Boom, f is continuous at A. And since A was randomly picked, it was arbitrary. That means f is continuous at every point in A, meaning that it is a continuous function. And there you go. Beautiful, wonderful proof. Again, I will, this is one of my all time favorites. Just every sentence is just clear. It's There's a clear direction to the proof. Just We have these definitions set up, and we're just unraveling them. And it's beautiful. All right, so now that we've proven this, we now have a characterization of continuity. And note, the only part of the definition... Uh, the only part, uh, the blah, 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 what am I saying? Okay, so we've now got a characterization of continuity, and note it was characterized purely in terms of sets, right? Continuity, inverse image of open sets remain open. No talk of epsilons or deltas. So if I can come up with a general definition of what open means, that means I could study continuity 
in any setting I want without having to get worried about, oh, you know, I need epsilons or deltas. So let's look at open sets a little bit more closely. Let's see if we can find some characteristic properties that they might have. All right, so we're going to prove the following facts about open sets. The empty set is open. All of the real numbers is open. Given any two open sets, the intersection remains open. And given any collection of open sets, their union is open. So uh, again, recall, this is the collection of things that are in both U and V, and this is the collection of things that belong to at least one U sub alpha. Okay, so the first thing to note here is that um, the empty set is uh, vacuously open. Or it's vacuously true, right? Think about what the, uh, uh, the definition is. Given an element in the set, there's things that happen, right? So A implies B, right? Given something in, given something in the set, then B occurs. All right, well, nothing is in the empty set, so A is always false, but a false assumption, the implication is always true, right? From a false hypothesis, you can conclude anything. So uh, the empty set is technically open. It's technically correct of the best kind. All right, cool. All right, now the real numbers are pretty easy. See that they're open as well. Take any element of the reals, then just pick your favorite positive real number. I won't have one here. You can do pi. You can do root two. Um, you can do the Euler Mascarone constant. Don't get real fancy. Um, you can do 5040, which is uh, you know an interesting number. Anyway, okay. Well, let's prove uh, three now. This one's going to be a little bit more involved. Okay, so I want to prove this intersection is open. All right, so that means I need to find a epsilon. I need to find an open interval that lives uh, within the set. All right, well, let's unravel the definitions here. So X lives in both U and V. Since it's in U, there is an epsilon that keeps me within U. And since it's in V, there is an epsilon that keeps me within V. So we've already seen this in play before. If I have two strictly positive real numbers, usually in a proof here, we'll just take the minimum. Sometimes you take the maximum, but usually you take the minimum. All right, so now what I want to show, I'm going to show that this lives in the intersection. So take a y that lives in there. That must mean that y is within epsilon of x, which means it has to be within epsilon sub 1 and epsilon sub 2. Since it's within epsilon sub 1, that means you're in uh, u, and since you're within epsilon of 2 of x, that means you're in v. So you're in both u and v, which means you're in the intersection. So given any element in the intersection, there is an interval I can find that remains in the set, which is precisely what open means. And again, note, I'm doing open for just the reals. I'm not talking open relative to a set. More on that in a little bit. All right, now let's prove unions work. And so let's note here the uh, union. Um, so uh, I'm a little lazy with the notation here. Um, before uh, I, I included the indexing, um, Union is one of those symbols where all mathematicians get lazy and just go, yeah, you know what I mean. You know where lambda is. Um, so, there you go. All right, um, so let's say you're in the union. What does that mean? Again, that means you're just in some element, right? You, you landed in some use of alpha, where alpha is some thing in uh, lambda. Now, note, um, if you're immediately going here, ooh, what happens if lambda is empty, right? That's very possible. That would just mean the union is the empty set, which we know is open. So, hey. All right. Okay. Now, uh, since you're in uh, U sub alpha and U sub alpha is open, there is an interval that keeps you within there, but U sub alpha it must be a subset of its union, right? Because this union contains everything that lives in all those sets, which means it contains all this stuff. So you get the interval that lives in the union, and there we go. Beautiful. So we have now proven that the empty set is open, the set of all real numbers is open, intersecting open sets keeps us open, and unioning, uh, intersecting a pair, and unioning any number. So equipped with that, we now define officially what a topology is. So here it is. This is literally the definition of a topology. Given a set, a topology is a collection of subsets with the following three properties. The empty set and the whole set are in there, Given any two sets that are in this collection, the intersection is in there. And given any collection of sets so that each one of these sets lives in the topology, the union is in the topology. So, right, here we go. So our goal 
right is to get this notion of studying continuity. We've proven that continuity can be described solely in terms of inverse images of specific sets. We just demonstrated that these specific sets, the open sets of the real line, have some key properties. The empty set and the real line are open. The intersection of any two open sets is open, and the union of any number of open sets remains open. So that's what we'll use as our definition for a topology, a collection of sets that have those properties, sets that I'm just going to declare to be open. All right, so let's establish, and so as I just noted, let's get some uh, nomenclature going. So a set equipped with a topology is called a topological space. We write it as an ordered pair. The elements of the topology are called open sets. So note, we have open in the reals, a very specific definition involving epsilons, but now, just generally speaking, we can go, all right, you got any collection of sets with these three properties, we'll just call those open open with respect to this particular topology. Okay, um, so something that we frequently use with open sets is this idea of a neighborhood. So given a subset of X, an open set that contains it, is called an open neighborhood. Um, and following the previous point uh, here, the an open neighborhood of a singleton is just referred to as an open neighborhood of X. Note that it technically should be of X with some curly braces around it. But um, that looks dumb, and nobody does that. Um, when we talk about open neighborhood of a point, you just write it like that. All right, beautiful. So here we go. That's this is the this is just the definition of topology. This is precisely what the definition is. Now, what it's all about, right? That's what depends on the mathematician. But this is the every math every mathematician goes. This is what a definition of a topology is. Nobody nobody argues against this. Um, before we go further, it's worth noting historically um, who cooked this up. Uh, so topologies were first defined by a mathematician named Felix Hausdorff. Hausdorff, uh, we will talk about a lot because he literally created topologies. Um, his original definition included another axiom. Um, those are called Hausdorff spaces in his name. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so Hausdorff, one of my all-time favorite mathematicians, and like all of my favorite mathematicians, uh, the Nazis killed him. So great. Um, uh, Hausdorff, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, made the wrong choice to live in Germany and be Jewish. So, you know, that's great. Not a fan of the Nazis. I know that's a very controversial opinion to take these days, but um, they, they did murder pretty much all my favorite mathematicians and a bunch of other people, too. So not 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 good. Not good. But this uh, this math here, this is good. This is good stuff. All right. So now that we've got uh, what a topology is set up, naturally, we want to start exploring and studying. Okay. So a good way to start studying and exploring is to, of course, look at some examples. Well, we've already got one. The usual topology of the real line is the following set. Okay, so it's the collection of subsets. So this here is uh, my notation that I use for the power set uh, of a set, so the collection of subsets. So if U is in here, that means it's a uh, subset of the real line. All right. So, um, and how did we define open? Given an element that lives in U, then there is an epsilon, so the interval lands in here. So as we just proved, this forms a topology on the real numbers, right? The empty set is in here, the whole set is in here, given any two elements that are in there, their intersection is in there, and given any collection, the union lands in here. Cool. So other topologies that are present so let's note that not only can you put a topology on the reals, but for any set, there is a kind of this cheapo topology called the discrete topology, where you just take um, the topology to be defined to be the power set. So just every set is declared to be open. Um, now, note, this satisfies the definition. The empty set and the whole space are in here. Intersect any two elements. Yeah, that's still a subset. Take the union. That's still a subset. So you just... This is, uh, at first glance, might just be a weird, like, oh yeah, this works, but why would you care? And it turns out, well, we care because you want to talk about the uh, sort of the extreme examples that are present in any, um, you know, new definition that you come up with. So the other extreme 
So this is the most, the, the largest number of sets you can come up with to have a topology. The trivial topology, the least number of sets. So this forms a topology because, hey, the empty set and the whole space are in there. Intersect any two elements that are in here, you're going to get one of them. Union up any number of these, you're going to get these. Um, and that's pretty much it. All right. So um, here we go. So we've now got some sampling. So note the real numbers now, as we've just demonstrated, their usual topology is the one that we like to work with. However, now we know that it actually has some other topologies on it. It's got a um, discrete one. So a topology you can put on the real numbers is every set's open. Um, which, again, at first glance might be, why would you ever do this? Um, spoilers, it's a great uh, way to come up with counterexamples. And, likely, and uh, likewise, we could also give the real numbers another topology, the trivial one, where the only sets that are declared to be open are uh, the empty set and the whole set. And again, great for counterexamples. And another thing that's really great for counterexamples is one of my all-time favorites, the particular point topology. So um, here you declare uh, sets to be open precisely if they contain a particular point. That should be A, a and X, not A and A. Let me, let me fix that. That's, uh, that's no bueno. And for the magic of LaTeX, it uh, fixes itself. Yay! Look at that. Took it a minute. All right, cool. So um, this is a fun topology. So I'm not going to work through the details of the proof of uh, these three here that we just did. Um, uh, note that you do need to include the option that the set is empty because we want the empty set to be declared open because we saw that in the reals with our epsilon definition of uh, open. So we want to include that. We want to keep that. So, but uh, this is a neat little topology, and like I said, uh, the original definition of topology that Hausdorff came up with um, actually does not allow this to be a topology, and that was one. Of, this is one of the reasons why um, his other assumption uh, was later removed and included as an extra, like, oh, if you've got this property, that's a Hausdorff space, which we'll get to. Uh, not today, but later on. All right, so one topology that I want to take the time to really prove, like work through all of the details, is the following. So given a topological space and a subset, then if you look at the collection of things that are open sets intersected with uh, this fixed set A, this forms a topology on A. Now, why do I want to talk about this? And why do I really want to go for the proof of this? Um, Remember, when we defined open in the reals, we had them open relative to a set. Oh, I wonder if that's what this is. Mm. All right, so let's actually work for the proof here. Let's let's explicitly demonstrate that this is a topology. Now, what does it mean to be a topology? I got to demonstrate three things. Empty set and whole set, and the whole set are in here. Intersect any two, I'm in there. Union any number, I'm still in here. All right, and it's pretty easy to see uh, that the empty set and the whole space are in here because the empty set and X are open. So A and the empty set then must live in Tau sub A. Right, because again, remember, to be in Tau sub A, you just need to be an open set intersected with A. Okay, so take uh, two open sets, G and H. Um, so if you're noticing here, usually the letters we use for open sets are U and V. Um, G and H also show up if we've used U and V. And if you need more letters, um, yeah, start picking. I've seen E sometimes, um, and maybe N, uh, you know, open, E and N are there, yeah. Okay, but what I want to show, I want to show that G intersect H is in tau sub A. Now, what does it mean to be in tau sub A? Unraveling definitions here. That means that G is uh, U intersected with A, and H is uh, V intersected with A. Since the intersection of U and V has to be in tau, that means when I look at G intersected with H, um, uh, there's an A that's missing. Oh boy, these are high quality slides. Look at this. You hear some dogs barking. Those are mine. They're barking at me. Tell me how terrible of a job I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you intersect these two, you get U intersected with V, and then A intersected with A just comes along for the ride, and of course is just A. And here we go. G intersects with A lives in Tau sub A. 
Cool. All right. So, lastly, we need to verify that the union of any uh, number of elements that uh, live in Tau sub A remains in Tau sub A. Okay, so take a bunch of things that live in Tau sub A, we're going to prove that their union is in there. Now, since uh, G lambda lives in Tau sub A, that means for each G lambda, since we're in the set, that means we can find a U so that G lambda is U lambda intersected with A. And, hey, each one of the U's lives in here, so that means their union lives in here. So if we look now at the union of the G's, that's the union of these. Um, and this is a set theoretic move that you can pull. Um, if you're unioning an intersection, you can just union up all this stuff and then intersect later. Okay, so here's something that hopefully that you're noticing. Um, there is going to be a lot of union and intersection uh, maneuvering that is done in topology. And hopefully that's not too shocking. The definition of a topology is built off of union and intersection. So there's going to be a lot of moves involving those operations that we're going to pull. Um, and hopefully you've solved these proofs in uh, 201. Um, if not, these are not too difficult to prove. It's just, you know, again, unravel definitions. Beautiful. All right. Now, uh, before I move on, um, it's worth noting that our proof here is good. It's true, but it does rely on something. There's a uh, subtlety here that's being invoked. Note that um, my assumption is that G lambda is in here. Okay. Now, since G lambda is in here, that means there is a U so that G lambda is equal to U intersect A. Now, here's a question for you. Is it unique? Right, so uh, G lambda lands in this set here, which means that it's equal to U intersect A for some open set U. Is it unique? It's not, actually. There could be more than one uh, open set that works. And, in fact, uh, you've got no idea how many there could be. So I am technically, technically using uh, the axiom of choice here. It's very subtle, but you are actually using it. Um, and uh, the axiom of choice, of course, um, some mathematicians get um, uh, in a tizzy over when it shows up and when you use it, because some of them don't think it's true. Um, of course, it's independent from our usual assumptions of how math works. Um, so just go ahead and use it. <laughs> uh, but but for those of you that uh, maybe have an eye for this, it's worth noting that I'm technically using the axiom of choice. Now, it is worth noting you can actually rework this proof so that you don't use the axiom of choice, um, but it's super clunky. It's, 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 it's really, it's not, it's so much worse of a proof for no good reason other than you avoided the axiom of choice. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it's not too hard. So it turns out there's a minimal open set you can find. There, there's a minimal representation. You can use that. Anyway. So, worth pointing out. Um, I, and it's one of those things, too. Like, um, I remember when I saw this proof in my topology class in grad school, and I didn't think anything of it. And then, like, years later, I saw an article where somebody pointed out, like, oh, hey, by the way, um, the relative topology, which is what this is, you can do this without the axiom of choice. It's like every proof that you'll ever see in any textbook is this one right here. And, and the, uh, the author of that article, I don't remember his name or their name, um, noted like, yeah, you can do it without the axiom of choice and here's how you do it. And eh, worth pointing out. Uh, but anyway, now that we've proven this, let's now prove that our definition of open relative to a set in the reals is precisely this. So here we go. We defined open relative to a set A in the reals, and we're now going to prove that that really just means that my set U lived in this topology that you can put on A. Ah, nice. Okay. So let's do this proof. All right. So let's suppose that U is open in A. I want to show that it's in tau sub A, which means that I need to show that U is equal to an open set in the reals intersected with A. Again, that's what tau A means. All right, what does it mean to be open in A? Okay, well, that means for each element that lives in U, there is an epsilon, so uh, the interval intersected with A uh, is contained in U. 
And uh, here you go again. How many positive epsilons are there for x? There's a lot of choices. There are a lot of choices here that work. Now, again, this is technically using the axiom of choice, but um, you can get around it by just picking the biggest possible one. There is a there is a largest. You can do the supremum, and you can come up with a specific one if you want to use it. But again, that just makes the proof worse. We don't need to worry about this. But worth noting, if you, if you are a uh, aficionado of the axiom of choice, then uh, yeah. Okay, so what do I want to show now? All right, well, I'm looking for an open set so that the open set intersect with A is equal to U. All right, well, for each element of U, I've got this open set intersecting with A contained in U. All right, well, how about I just union up all of those things? And remember, the union of open sets remains open. Ooh, so this little move here is very common when you're working with open sets, where for each point, you come up with an open set, and then you just union it all up. So, by construction, uh, if we just unravel how it is defined, if I intersect uh, V with A, what am I going to find? All right, well, I'm going to get this union, and it'll intersect with A. All right, and as we already talked about, you can just pull that intersection in, and each one of these, by its construction, is contained in U, so the union is in U. Okay, so I've got V intersect A is contained in U. All right, now take anything that lives in U. That, uh, right, we know that X needs to live in this interval, which means that X has to be in V. And since X is in U, that means it's in A, so that means it's in uh, V intersect A. So that means U is a subset of V intersect A. So that means that U must equal that intersection, so it must be in uh, our topology that's of A. Cool. All right, so if U is open in A, as we defined, then we must belong to this topology that you can define on A. And now let's go in reverse. Suppose that you are in this topology you defined on A. That means that you're equal to uh, V intersect A for some open set V. So I want to show that I can find an interval that does what I want. So take an element in U, that must mean it is in V. So I've got my epsilon. All right, and then you just intersect both sides, and there you go. We've got that U as an open set relative to A from our definition that we already saw uh, for the real line. Cool. All right, so cool with these results, we introduced the following uh, conventions. So unless otherwise stated, um, any subset of a topological space is assumed to be equipped with the topology uh, Tau sub A, unless for some reason you want to put a different topology on it. Almost never do you do that. If you've got a topological space and then you take a subset of it, you give it this topology. And it's called the relative topology, so the topology relative to the subset A, and um, sometimes it's referred to as a topological subspace. And the elements, based on what we just proved, we call those open in A. So as we saw, our definition of open in A originally for the reals is just precisely this idea of a relative topology. So where you create a topology by just taking the fixed set A and intersecting it with any open set that you can think of. All right. Beautiful. Cool. All right. Now, uh, before we move on to some other things, it's worth taking a moment and proving something that's uh, very powerful and useful, um, which is the following. Um, a set is open if every element of the set has an open neighborhood that doesn't escape the set. So note, our definition of open in the reals was given any element that lives in the set, there is a open interval that doesn't escape the set. The same thing can be proven for any general topology, right? Remember, we proved open intervals are open. So this is literally just that. So the way we define openness in the reals is actually just true. Okay. So it's worth taking a moment and proving this and kind of seeing, you know, hey, all the stuff that we're doing in the reals, like really uh, the whole interval and epsilon thing, you don't, you don't really need that. You just need a notion of open and then, pretty much all that stuff we were doing goes through without a hitch. 
And it's worth doing this proof because, again, um, it's going to see this. Uh, we saw this already um, in action where you kind of take an element. Each element has an open set associated with it. Then you just union them all up. And by uh, construction, uh, this union of all these X's is obviously contained in A because each one of the U's are in there. And uh, for any X that lives in A, it lives in one of these U sub X's. So uh, this union will balloon up to all of A. And since this is a union of open sets, that means A itself must be open. Cool. Nice. So it's worth taking a moment and just stopping and proving this because this is typically how you actually prove a set is open is showing that every element in the set has an open neighborhood that contain, remains in the set. So exactly how we define openness for the reals. Those um, subsets so that there is an interval that keeps me uh, within the set. So here we see, like, yeah, that's just how open is going to work. Right. And again, note, no epsilons, no intervals, just purely sets. Sets, subsets, unions, intersections, that's all we're using. So, it's nice. We're free. We're free from the tyranny of the reals. Okay, beautiful. All right. So, um, it's worth now uh, introducing the uh, related term to open, which is closed. So, in a topological space, a set is called closed if its complement is open. So, this is the set of elements so that x is in uh, x, but not in f. All right. Now, uh, the following immediately follows from our definitions. The empty set and X are closed. The union of two closed sets is closed. And uh, yeah, I did that on purpose, obviously. Uh, hopefully, you <laughs> uh, hopefully you've got a good sense of where my humor lies uh, in the toilet. Uh, so. Um, so with closed sets, um, F and K are the symbols that we use for closed sets usually. So this is just a happy accident, I guess. Or somebody deliberately was having a, a giggle. Okay, so the union of any two closed sets is closed, and the intersection of any number of closed sets is closed. And I'm not going to go for the proof of this, because it's just immediate from how things are defined. Uh, but, for example, number two can be proven explicitly. Since F and K are closed, that means their complements are open. We know that... Um, the intersection of any two open sets is open, so that means this is open, which means that uh, F, U, F U K there uh, is a closed set. So yeah, this is just using how complements work, and um, yeah, cool. All right, so something that I want to uh, say about uh, open and closed before we go further here. Um, the words open and closed in English, we kind of think of them as opposites of each other. Um, but note, it's possible to be both open and closed. So the empty set and the whole set are both open and closed. Um, and uh, a set that is both open and closed is called clopen. And the opposite of that is true. It's possible for a set to not be open and not be closed. So if you know you're not open, that does not mean you're closed. Um, I had a professor tell me that a set that's not open and not closed should be called a jar. It's like, it's a door, it's not exactly open or closed, it's just, it's a jar. Um, but yeah. Um, so yeah, that's an immediate thing that a lot of people will get a little bit confused about with open and closed sets, is that uh, not being open does not mean you are closed. Um, and uh, speaking of Hitler, um, there's a very funny... Um, uh, uh, so the movie Downfall, um, there's that scene where Hitler freaks out and it's a big old meme. Um, there is a, uh, Hitler freaking out about the definition of open and closed, um, edit of that, which is, uh, a, a laugh riot. Anyway. All right, let's continue and define some more things about open and closed sets. All right, so. Um, something that we do a lot in mathematics is, uh, try to find, like, the optimal versions of something. So, given any subset, we don't necessarily know if it's open or closed, right? Again, it's open if it's in the topology, it's closed if its complement is in the topology. 
But that doesn't mean we can't associate to every set a closed set that's related to it. So the closure is the intersection of all closed sets that contain E. And likewise, the interior is the union of all open sets that are contained within the set E. So any subset is not necessarily in a topology, but we can always associate with it an open set and a closed set that are, in some sense, good enough. So as we are about to prove, the closure of E is just the smallest closed subset that contains E, and the interior is the largest open set that is contained within E. And um, at first glance, you might look at these and go, okay, sure, this feels like a thing you could do, but who cares why? Um, these will, the uh, who cares why will become uh, more apparent as we go forward and get some more theorems, and these are things we're going to want. If at first glance, these might feel like they're coming out of nowhere. Yeah, they, a little bit, but trust me, these are, these are good and important. All right, so what are we going to prove about these? Uh, well, we're going to prove a bunch. So specifically, we'll prove the closure is closed, the interior is open, um, the closure contains E, the interior is contained in E. Given any closed set that contains E, the closure is contained inside of it, so the closure is the smallest closed set containing the original set E. And given any open subset that's contained in E, the interior contains that open set, so the interior is the largest open subset of E. Okay, and then we'll prove that you're closed if you're equal to your closure, and you're open if you're equal to your interior. So this actually gives you a way of detecting open or closed based on do you line up with these specific sets. So again, for a topological space, a given subset could be neither open nor closed. But we can associate to that set a closed set and an open set, so it doesn't feel left out. It has a body. All right, um, so I'm going to prove all the stuff about clope, uh, clope, uh, the closure. Um, everything but the interior is just uh, analogous. Um, uh, the closure, it turns out, in practice is usually a little bit more important than the interior. So we'll see. All right. Okay, so first thing to note, how is the closure defined? Well, it was the intersection of all closed sets that contain E. Okay, it's intersection of closed sets. It's closed. Boom. Done. Roasted. Same thing for the interior. It's a union of open sets. Done. Don't need to do anything else. All right, now we're going to prove, all right, we're going to prove the closure uh, contains of the set E. All right, well, remember the closure is the intersection of all these things that live in F. All right, well, each element that lives in here contains E, so if I do their intersection, the collection of all things that belong to all these elements well, E's there, so E lives and that's it. Similarly for uh, the interior, you're just uniting up subsets. You're not going to escape the set. All right, next up. Our hypothesis was that we had a closed set that contained E. That means the closed set lives in this uh, family. So when you do the intersection of all the elements of the family, all right, well, Given an element in here, that means it belongs to all k. That's a lowercase k. I need to make that a capital k. You know, I go through these slides, like, multiple times. This is the second time I'm recording this video, by the way. And I still... <laughs> in your, it, 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 it come in my head, come back out, tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, no. Anyway. All right. Uh, but yeah, so f is in this family. So if I intersect everything in here, remember, this is all the things that live in every set that's in the family... Well, F's in the family, so anything that's in the set lives in there. And there we go. So, indeed, the closure is the smallest closed subset that contains E. Um, similarly for uh, the interior, um, you're, again, you're unioning up subsets that are contained in it. Obviously, the uh, interior, any open set would be within the interior, because you're unioning up all of them. All right, now let's prove closed if and only if you're equal to your closure. All right, well, so if you're closed, point 0.5 um, reveals to us that since E is a subset of E, that means the closure must be contained in E, right? That's by definition. The closure is the smallest closed subset that contains E. If E is itself closed, that means the closure must be a subset of it. But as we noted, E is a subset of its closure. So 
A, E must equal E. So again, note here, uh, the arguments that we're making, all of the proofs that we're doing here, are purely set theoretic. They are just arguments based off of how subset, intersection, and union behave, and uh, also complements. Right, so the basic set theoretic tools that we have, we're just using them, right? And we're, we're not getting hung up on anything else. We're not getting hung up on epsilons or deltas or real numbers and you know, it's an ordered field, least upper bound property. We're not giving a shit about any of that stuff. Just how do sets work? And that's what we're doing here. Okay, now conversely, let's say that you are equal to your closure. Well, the closure is closed, so boom, you're closed. Wonderful proof. The best proof. The proof that is, yeah, that's the definition. Done. <laughs> Always a good time when your proofs are that easy. All right. So let's take a moment to prove something about the closure. And um, we're getting a little close to the end here. Hopefully this, this, this here looks very familiar, hopefully. So given a topological space and a subset E, it turns out we can define the closure in terms of open neighborhoods. So specifically the closure of a set E is the collection of points in X so that for any open neighborhood of X, U intersected uh, E is not empty. So it's the collection of points so that every open neighborhood around that point meets the set E. <sighs> given a point, there's an interval around it that meets the set. Oh, wasn't that the definition of a, a limit point? Uh, well, not quite, but we'll get there. All right. Okay. So what am I going to prove here? Well, I'm going to prove uh, that this set on the right, let's call that B for right now, is actually equal to the closure. So I need to prove two sets are equal. So let's show that we've got subset in both directions. All right. Take an element of the closure. I'm going to show that it must live in B. So take any open neighborhood of X. If this open set did not meet E, that means E lives in the complement. Right? Again, just using some ideas of sets. If this intersection is empty, E is contained in the complement. Everything that's in E cannot be in U. So it's got to be in X complemented with U. And oh, hey, U is open, so this is closed. Since that's closed, the closure is contained in it because the closure is the smallest closed subset containing E, but I got a problem. X is in the closure, but now you've got that it's not in U, but by assumption, it's in U. So it's got to be that this intersection was, in fact, non-empty, and thus X is in B. And, oh my god, if you are, is your math brain, the neurons firing, because this... This is, again, one of those proofs to me that's just so elegant. It's just literally, literally unraveling the definitions. We've set up these beautiful definitions. We got the best definitions, folks. Um, and we are just using them, and, and we're getting theorems. It's wonderful. And it's, it's just, it's so beautiful to me. It's just, these are just so, like, just simple proofs. And, we're, and again, it's purely just sets just the, the building block of math we're not assuming anything else we're, we're not gunking things up with algebra you know it's just purely like yeah this is how sets work bro it's great all right okay so uh again we're proving that the closure is equal to this so all right took something in the closure prove that it's in b let's go in reverse take something in b we'll show that it's in the closure all right so what are we gonna do okay well the complement of, of a closed set is open. Uh, the, bleh, so the complement of an open set is closed. The complement of a closed set must be open. So since the closure is uh, a closed set, that means this complement here is open. If X was not in the closure of E, that means that U then would have to have been an open neighborhood of X because X would be in the set, but the complement of a closed set is open, in the same way that the complement of an open set is closed. That's how open and closed interact with each other. All right, but that would be an open neighborhood, and then since you're in B, that means this intersection is non-empty, but that means there's something that lives in U and lives in E, but Z is in U, which is uh, um, the complement of the closure, 
But since E is a subset of the closure, that means the complement of the closure is contained in the complement of E. But now we've got something that lives in E and doesn't live in E. So that's contradictory. So it's got to be that we're in the closure. Boom. Proof over. Nice. All right, cool. So here we go. We've got a nice characterization of closure in terms of open neighborhoods. So, right, even though we're talking about the smallest closed set containing E, in any topological space, any property can be described purely in terms of the open sets, because, again, that's what makes a topology a topology. And, like I noted, if you saw this and thought about it for a moment and went, huh, every open neighborhood meets the set. Given any open interval, it meets the set. Wasn't that limit point? Yeah, so let's uh, let's prove that. So given a topological space and a subset uh, A, we say that um, a point is a accumulation point. If given any open neighborhood of that point A, then there is an element uh, in the set so that you're in the open neighborhood, excluding the point. Oh, hey. This is just the topological characterization of what it means to be a limit point. So let's prove this. So, suppose you're a limit point. Take any open neighborhood. Since there's an open neighborhood, you've got a nice interval that lives in there. Since you're a limit point, remember, that means that given any epsilon, there is an element in A that is within epsilon and, hey, not equal to A. So you must be in U complemented A. So you take A and you delete a point, you're in the set. Woo! Hey, hey! Here we go. So, the building block of continuity, limit point, uh, the building point of limits, which was the building block for continuity, here's the topological characterization of it. Alright, so conversely, suppose you do have an accumulation point, so we'll use this definition. That means, um, given an epsilon, this is a nice open neighborhood, so that means we can find an element X that lives in A that lands in this, but not including it. That's what it means to be an accumulation point here. All right, but that means we get this, which was precisely our definition for a limit point. Beautiful. Hey, hey. There we go. So um, in light of this proposition we just demonstrated, uh, accumulation points, we can call these limit points as well. Um, and, and these two words are used interchangeably, um, so that's why I use the limit point for the reals, um, because we use them to build limits. Um, they're also called accumulation points, because there's points that are accumulated nearby. Um, so accumulation or limit point, either phrase is used. Um, and um, as we noted, uh, it seemed like the accumulation point, the way we set it up, right, the, the way... Uh, so it seemed that we saw with the closure of a set, the closure looks like it lined up with uh, the set of limit points, right? Not exactly. So given a set, the set of limit points is called the derived set, and it's usually written as A prime. I've seen other notation. But it turns out that the closure of a set is just it, the original set unioned with the accumulation points. And this then gives us an alternate definition of closed. You're closed if and only if you contain all your limit points. Cool. All right, this will be the last thing we prove, and so let's prove it. Okay, so let's take any element in the closure. There are two possibilities. Okay, if you're in E, then we're done. You're just in the set. Boom. All right, so suppose that you're not in E. All right. Now, since uh, we're in the closure, that means for every open neighborhood of X, we have that this intersection is not empty, right? We proved that. So fix an element Z in here. Uh, note, we can't have Z is equal to X, otherwise, um, uh, Z is not in E. Not that Z is in E. Where's the, yep. Yeah. Right, note, since uh, we are assuming that X is not in E, if z is actually equal to x, that would mean z is uh, not in e, but z is in e by construction. So that means that z is in the set u, and it's not x. So it's in uh, this uh, set right here, u deleting x, which means it's a limit point, which means it's in the derived set. 
Cool, so if you're in the closure, you're either in the set or you're a limit point of the set. Cool. Conversely, let's say you're in the union. Again, two possibilities. So if you're in E, right, since you're in the union, um, you're in one of the sets. If you're in E, then you're in the closure. Done. Suppose we're a limit point. All right, take any open neighborhood. Well, since you're a limit point, we know that there is an element that lives in U and E and is not equal to X, right? So again, it's a point that's nearby, but not in the set. Well, Z by construction is in both U and E, so this intersection is not empty, which means you're in the closure, as we proved. So boom, there we go. All right, and then finally, suppose that uh, a set is closed. By one, we know that the derived set, E union E, oh my god, uh, oh my god, I can't even stick the landing here. It should be E prime right there. Uh, e prime is contained in this union, which, as we just demonstrated, is the closure, and by hypothesis, since we're closed, E is equal to that, and there we go. Now, conversely, suppose that the derived set, the collection of all limit points, is contained in E. All right, well... E is contained in the closure. The closure is equal to E prime union E, as we just demonstrated. Um, e prime is contained in E, so that means it's contained in this union, which is just E. So E is a subset of the closure of E, which is a subset of E, so those sets must be equal. Beautiful. So, everything we talked about last week, limit points, open sets, all of it can be done purely in terms of topology, as we just demonstrated beautiful. And we're only scratching the surface. How are we going to talk topology and open sets? Mm. Maybe that's our next target. All right, but that's enough for today. We almost got to an hour here, so let's call it. Um, therefore useless. All right, so let's wrap up with what uh, the student presentations uh, is going to be. So next week, we're going to have two of them. Uh, one that was supposed to happen this week, and then um, the one that we'd set up if we had actually met in person. All right, so the first thing we're going to demonstrate is um, uh, the union is not the, the intersection. Um, so as we demonstrated, uh, the union of any open number of open sets remains open. Um, it is possible for the intersection of an infinite number of sets to not be open. So uh, our assumption that if any two open sets, the intersection of the two of them is open, cannot be extended to an infinite number. It can only be a finite number of intersections of open sets. Okay. Okay, so another topology that you can introduce is the following. Um, a set is said to be open if uh, it's uh, empty or if its complement's finite. So this actually creates a topology, it's called the cofinite topology, and it's one that shows up in a lot of interesting places. And it's also worth proving. All right, and then the final thing that a student will demonstrate is that um, as uh, we had an open neighborhood characterization of closure, there's an open neighborhood characterization of interior as well. Um, and in some sense, this is an easier thing to prove. Uh, but there we go. All right, that's it for today. All right, so next time uh, we will now set our sights on continuity, and we're going to have a good time. All right, so that is it, and I'll see you next time.